So, now, it is my enormous pleasure to introduce the next speaker, uh, who is uh, 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 Karina Crawford Khan from Citizens UK, uh, and she's head of growth at Citizens UK. Now, I first came across Karina when we were both speaking at a uh, King's Fund conference, and I got a nice note afterwards from David Buck saying how popular the speakers were with the audience and how, what good feedback they'd had. Well, I made the mistake of looking at the feedback, and every single one was about, was about Karina and nothing about me at all. And they were all saying how inspirational her talk was, how it changed the way, how it changed the way they thought about things, and all these good things. So my immediate response was to book her for our conference. Um, but seriously, Citizens UK is an extraordinary organization, and uh, Karina's going to talk through a little bit about the, her work uh, and the work of Citizens UK. But the main point is in the title. It's about handing over power to individuals, to the community, so that they can improve their own health and that they can address inequalities through their own action and through their own power. And I think this is a nice talk to end the conference on, give you something to think about on, on your way home. And I think it, would bracket, it brackets nicely with uh, Secretary of State's talk this morning, which presents a slightly different view of the world. So, uh, anyway, so um, I'd like you to all join me in welcoming Karina to the stage. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, and thank you, John. Um, that's uh, very nice uh, remarks that you gave for my speech. Um, I actually think that you said to me, are you available for conferences, weddings, and funerals? Right, yeah. <laughs> um, so conferences, potentially. Weddings after last night, who knows? Um, and funerals, let's see. Um, so thank you also for staying for the rest of the afternoon. I know you've been here for two days, um, and some of you have come from very far distances. Uh, so I'm, I'm Karina Crawford Khan. I'm a lead organizer with Citizens UK. And why am I here today? I guess I was asking myself the same question and thinking about what I would bring to this afternoon. Uh, and I guess what I'm bringing today is, is challenge, a challenge to you. Um, because this morning we talked a lot about changing behavior of communities. But actually, if we're going to think about changing behavior of communities, we need to start with changing your behavior and changing how you behave and act. Because you are the communities. There is no difference between yourself and the communities that we've talked, to, talked about over the last two days. So in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to bring challenge. I'm going to bring an argument for change. And I'm going to hopefully give you some tools to be able to put that into practice when you go back to your work, your place where you live, your communities this afternoon, tomorrow. So who am I? As I said, I'm Karina Crawford Khan. I'm lead organizer with Citizens UK. Some of you might know Citizens UK. We're a national charity working across England and Wales. We work in about 15 locations. In those 15 locations, we have alliances of civil society organizations, so faith groups, ch churches, synagogues, mosques, schools, universities, trade unions, charities, ta taxi drivers, boxing clubs, you name it, where there are people, they can join our local alliance. Our mission statement is to develop people to participate in public life and to strengthen the institutions that they come from. Take what you want from that. It means different things to different people. We're most known for the Real Living Wage campaign, which we established in East London about 15 years ago, when we heard the voices of priests and teachers and families saying, it's no good that we're working two, if not three, jobs to support ourselves. Why is it that we can't get home in time to do our homework with our kids? Why is it that we can't turn up to mass on a Sunday because we're having to work that second job? So the real living wage came out of these stories that we heard in East London. And then we started to think about who were the businesses that could afford to pay decent wages to their staff. And it first started off in Canary Wharf with HSBC. And it's now a national movement which has got put millions of pounds back into the pockets of the poorest paid families. We're also known for the campaign that I led in 2010 to 2014, 
which was to end the detention of children for immigration purposes, something that our teachers and our families who had experienced the detention centre said that that had to stop. And in 2010, we got the political agreement, but it took four years to get that into legislation. Four years of hard negotiations, of the families sharing their stories, and us coming up with practical solutions that would make the difference. Um, we're also known for some of the work that we've done with the Mayor of London around introducing 30, minimum 35% affordable housing um, on some of the new developments in London. But that's Citizens UK. Who am I? Uh, so, Karina Crawford Khan. I'm the daughter of teachers, come from a family of teachers. My mother, my grandmother, my grandfather, my auntie, uncles, everyone was a teacher. But I was a bit disruptive in school and got chucked out of quite a lot of lessons. And so I found it difficult to go into formal education. So worked as a youth worker to start with. And I first cut my teeth in a youth centre in South London, Marcus Lipton Youth Centre, which tragically hit the news earlier this year because a young man ran into the youth centre for safety and was stabbed to death in front of 55-year-olds. Those five-year-olds still haven't received counselling. And if we were thinking about trauma and violence that leads to violence, what impact did that have on those five-year-olds? That didn't happen when I was there 12 years ago, but they were the types of things that I was seeing on a regular basis. So young people would come into the youth centre and self-harm in front of me. Young people would be carrying knives, guns, and I'd have to be negotiating with them about what the repercussions were. Um, a whole list of things, you know, I don't need to name them. And I felt incredibly frustrated with always putting a plaster on a massive wound. I have to admit, I didn't vote the first time I could vote. For my sins, because I've later found out that my great times five grandfather was an MP, and my great-grandmother was part of the suffragette movement. So politics is also in my blood. But I didn't feel like voting or participating was actually going to make a difference on my life and the young people that I was working with. I'm also a foster carer. I have a 17-year-old boy at the moment. Who knew that Nike trainers now cost 150 pounds? <laughs> I found that out very quickly last week when I got cornered in the Nike shop thinking about buying his present. Uh, I was an amateur boxer, I'm no longer. A little bit old for that now. But I'm a, a boxing coach in my local boxing gym, right around the corner from the Marcus Lipson Youth Centre. So that's my community, it's where I live, it's where my heart is. Um, but I'm frustrated with not necessarily tackling the, the root causes of systemic challenges that these young people were facing. So in 2009, I found community organising with Citizens UK. Aristotle talks about our calling, our vocation, being where the, means, the needs of the world meet our talent. And I want all of you to reflect on that. What's your vocation? Have you found it? Are you searching for it? Have you found that cross where the needs of the world meet your talent? I'm still looking for it. It's not always clear. But I think that's what brings us meaning and purpose and hope. Hope's a really important word, particularly times like now. People feel hopeless, full of fear, what's going to happen. But hope is one of the greatest gifts that we can give someone else. Because the one thing that we can have to really believe that change can actually happen, that things don't have to be the way that they are. I think that there's two types of people in this world. There's those that have hope, that will do what they can to try and make things a little bit different. And there's those that have cynicism, 
there's always going to be a reason why something can't happen, why it can't be different. And if I was still a boxer, I know who I'd have in my corner. So let's go back to the challenge, the challenge that I bring you today. I fundamentally believe that powerlessness leads to ill health. And if we're about building healthy communities, then how are we about building the power of communities in order for them to be healthy? At the heart of powerlessness is the fact that anger without power leads to rage. And I think that's what we're seeing in the rise in domestic violence, in suicides, in self-harm, in hate crime, in serious youth violence, is the fact that people are angry and they don't have the power to do anything about it. But power simply is the ability to act. If you look at the definition in the dictionary, it's a very neutral term, the ability to act. And so if that anger is channeled in the right way, imagine the change that can happen on those issues if we genuinely build the power of people to act on the issues that they care about. So last night, I, I arrived late to the conference, I have to admit. Last night I was in a meeting in London and we had about 150 people coming together to think about what can we really do to tackle serious youth violence in the capital. And we had a room full of young people and teachers and faith leaders and lo some local decision makers. And there was a lot of fear of, of powerlessness. I remember a young boy called JP from Brixton who said he's tired of going to barbecues in memory of his friends that have been killed. He's tired of looking at the fear of his friends when they've got blood running down their body from the stab wounds. He's tired at looking at the hopelessness in his friends that carry knives. But by the end of the two hours, I asked him, how do you feel? And he said, powerful. Because we'd spent two hours thinking through really what are some of the tangible solutions that communities can lead and work with decision makers to drive change on these big, sometimes huge problems. So breaking it down to what support do parents need? Because we all know, you all know, that it's those crucial years between naught and three that make a difference. And if we can intervene then, then how many lives can we save? I heard stories of, par of fathers who were fighting hard to prevent their three-year-old son, who had autism, from being expelled from nursery. And this is kids being expelled from nursery, from primary school. By the time they get to secondary school, who knows what's happening? So it's our duty to build the power of parents, of primary school teachers, of secondary school head teachers, to think through what resources do they need in order to prevent some of these challenges that young people are facing. We also had Lib Peck there with us this evening, last night, sorry, um, the director of the Violence Reduction Unit in London. And she said at the end of her uh, presentation, so the fact that the policy isn't meant to be written and then delivered. It's meant to be delivered, designed, developed with those that it was going to influence and implement and apply to. So her fundamental shift in behavior approach about getting people actually involved in thinking through what these policies might look like is what's needed across the board. So my challenge to you is what power do you have? Recognize the power that you have, not to give it away, but to think through how you can support building the power of communities that you work with and what that might look like. 
to focus on building relationships, deep, deep relationships that are built around common interests, common hopes, common fears, not partnerships where there's contracts to be signed and outcomes to be delivered, but deep, deep relationships that you'll work together to tackle some of the issues that you want to tackle together. To take risks, building power means taking some risks, and also to be accountable. Be accountable to yourselves, to your colleagues, and to the community. I think often community members don't feel that they can hold decision makers to account. Because in their experience, they haven't, they can't. So think about mechanisms of accountability. Sorry, I should have said it right at the beginning. I'm not used to speaking at conferences, I'm used to speaking at youth groups and churches. So if I say the odd alleluia, that might be why. But also, I am rubbish at using my PowerPoint. So anyway. <laughs> the second challenge I want to bring to you is something that Martin Luther King refers to as the drum major instinct. We all have an innate desire to be recognized, to be heard, to be listened, to be seen, to be around the table, to play a role. From the minute that we enter this world, we cry for our parents' attention. And often, that's met. But what happens in adulthood is that that's not really met. We're still crying out for recognition, for our role, for our calling to be recognized, for our seat at the table to be given to us. But that often isn't given. There are many people in the communities that you work with that want to be around the table with you, thinking about the solutions. The question is, have you asked them what they can bring to the table, what talents they have? They're out there. Often we get lazy. We have the usual suspects that sit on our patient participation groups that are the self-elected leaders that don't represent anyone from their community apart from themselves and that bring their own baggage to the table. Yes, there is valid to that. There is some validity to that, but we can't just rely on them. We have to find others that can represent the, the community, that can sit around the table, that can work with you to think about what are some of the creative solutions that can be delivered. We have an iron rule in community organizing, which is called, well, we refer to it as the iron rule. It's never do something for someone that they can do for themselves. How many times have we said, oh, it's all right, I'll just get on and do it because I don't know if there's someone else that can do it. There are people out there that can that have the talents and the ability to lead and to deliver the solutions. We also think about real, genuine community leadership as leaders have followers. Without them, they're just someone is just going for a walk in the park. So those genuine community leaders in the primary schools, in the youth groups, in the faith groups, in the residence associations, they have relationships with other people who also have talents and gifts that can be part of the solution. Just going to embarrass Duncan a little bit. <laughs> I told him that I was going to put this up. Um, so Duncan came down to a school that I was working with in Greenwich in 2015. Gosh, it was a long time ago. Um, and what you'll see here is, yes, Duncan, this is at the moment speaking, but we had about 100 young people who had come up with the idea of a mental health charter because they had recognised what solutions they could bring to improving young people's mental health in Greenwich. Some of it was to do with school and, and school curriculum and the way that they could refer to... Um, talking therapies within the school 
But there were some very practical solutions that they put forward to the mental health trust in the area, which was around, if someone had missed their first appointment with CAMS, then there would be no follow-up. And so actually, what was the protocol to ensure that if a young person missed their first appointment, what was the phone call, the follow-up, the support that would be provided to that young person? Because there are many reasons why young people miss their first appointment. But that was all driven by young people themselves. And when Duncan came along to the assembly, he was actually sat in the audience and called up. The young people chaired the meeting and negotiated live with him on stage. Um, for us, that's leadership. Those young people who understand their own community, understand what the solutions are, and can drive the community forward together is a leadership that we appreciate. So my challenge to you is, how often do you get outside the four walls of your offices? How often do you have conversations with people that are different to you, that challenge you? How, when was the last time you created a role for someone based on their talents? I think I've got enough time. Just want to share a quick story, because I shared it with a wonderful woman who I met this morning for breakfast, Sarah, so I hope she's still here. Um, some of the work that we've been doing up in, in Durham, in, so we've got an alliance to Tyne and Weir citizens, Newcastle, Durham, Sunderland. Um, who would have known that the tension runs much deeper than the football clubs between Sunderland and Newcastle? Because I definitely didn't. Um, with my naivety there. But anyway, we worked with a secondary school in, in Durham, and we asked the simple question, you know, what, what issues do you care about? What would you like to see change? And a question, actually, from one year 10 pupil was asked back to us, I want to know what happens to the change that I don't spend when I'm on free school meals. So if you're on free school meals, you get £2.10 a day. You go to school, you spend it, that £2.10 is spent. You don't go to school on Tuesday, where do you think that £2.10 goes? I don't know. Good question. So we started asking around, and we found out that that £2.10 goes back to the providers. In some cases, that's the school. In some cases, that's the local authority. But in most cases... It's a private security firm like Sodexo that is getting that money that that young person deserves and is allocated. We worked out that it costs 350 pounds, is it? 250 pounds to change the system. And in one school changed their system, put 17,000 pounds back into the pockets of those children. We also can predict that if we change every school system across the UK, 65 million pounds will go back into the pockets of those children on free school meals. That came through us identifying young people as potential leaders and asking them, what matters to you? So have a think, if you're in an area, if you, that's something that alarms you, Go back to a school that you're connected to, local authority, and think about how you could make that difference. My last challenge is for us to put people before program. Too many policies are written without actually thinking about the named individuals that it's going to impact. Too many buzzwords are used. Co-production. <coughs> resilient communities, asset-based, without actually naming those communities that can be involved in delivering them. just want to quickly talk about a project that we run in Southwark, and thank you to Southwark Clinical Commissioning Group and, and Council, who I think might be in the room or were here this today. So parents and communities together in, in Southwark is a parent-led peer-to-peer -peer support group that came out of 
church members, primary school head teachers asking, what can we do to improve maternal health in Camberwell, South London? And it was about nine organisations working together at the time. And they started to develop the idea of a peer-to-peer -peer support group where you can't tell the difference between the member of staff, the volunteers, and the mums that are coming in. And parents come up with the ideas, the workshops that they actually want to run. We call it Parent University. But they tell each other what they want to learn and how to run those, those programs and who to bring in. And we're doing it that way because often they said, we go to some of the other mum and baby groups and we don't feel welcome. And we feel like we're doing a bad job. And it's parenting skills that might not necessarily apply to my personal situation. And we, don't, we, we feel judged. So we set a parent, well, parents and community together up. We now have over 100 mums that come together in Camberwell. We have the West African groups, the uh, Espacio Mama, which is the Latin American groups. We also have a group up in Newcastle, which is called Our Time, because the mums up there said that they wanted to call it Our Time, and a group in Leeds as well. And I have some evidence, because I know evidence is important. We work with the Institute of Psychiatry to measure the impact that peer-to-peer -peer support was having on, on these mothers. And just quickly, you can look, I'll look at the one on the category on the right, is the cases that were seen as kind of case cases when they referred into us um, were thir at 13.5 on this scale when they were referred into us in terms of anxiety measurements. After six months, that re was reduced down to 6.75. Six months. It's not a long time. Similarly with depression. The sample study, when referred in, 14.23. can see significantly above the threshold of being referred to IAPS after six months down to 7.23. That's because they felt welcomed. They felt they had a role to, to play. They felt powerful. They felt listened to. We're working with Southwark CCG and, and the local authority now to think about how that could be rolled out across the borough, but also how community organising and this model of, of leadership and building power can be rooted in regeneration programmes. How actually when you're building community, are the community at the heart of that right from the very beginning? So my challenge to you is, let's stop thinking about what we can do to the community, but what can we do with them? As I said earlier on, you are the community, there is no difference. I'm just going to leave you with this. I think yesterday the question was asked, does Public Health England, could it be more political? Politics doesn't have to be politics with a capital P. Politics is the art of the possible. My challenge to you is, how are you going to work together in the places that you work with people that are different to you to really imagine what that possible is? Thank you. Thank you so much.